is up, everybody? It is me, your host, Joe C., and this is yet another episode of the Hook Shots podcast, screaming at you in uh, semi-low res because we can't afford good equipment, but maybe, just maybe, Santa will answer our prayers for Sennheiser microphones. Anyway, uh, I digress on that. Uh, how's your Christmas shopping going? Are you done? Have you given Amazon all of your money yet? I have. And uh, if you still need ideas, we are uh, rolling out gift guides for sportsmen left and right over there at thefieldandstream.com. It is gift guide season, kiddos. And, uh, you know, of all the gift guides um, I've ever put together over the years, my, my favorite was absolutely the ultimate Jaws fan gift guide. I did that uh, last year. And it was a bunch of stuff that I found on, like, Etsy, ranging from cool Jaws stickers all the way up to hats that were, like, perfect replicas of Quint's hat in the film. And the outpouring of comments and messages and shares that I got on that gift guide were awesome, you know? And it's funny because I put so many, like, fly fishing gift guide, uh, this kind of gift guide together, but, man, like, the Jaws one... That one hit. That one resonated. And point being, Jaws fans are legion, right? Everybody loves some Jaws. I've 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 never really met an angler that is not a Jaws fan. Okay, uh, and it is hands down, without question, my all time favorite film. Um, easily, partially responsible for shaping me as an angler. Like, that that's no joke. I'm a 37-year-old man, and even now, like, sitting in this office, if I look over here, I've got my Jaws light switch cover, okay? If I look over here to my left on my board, uh, pinned to it is a uh, G.I. Joe-style Quint action figure. My entire life, I have surrounded myself with all things Jaws. So, uh, you know who else is a high-caliber Jaws freak? Give you one guess. And if you said our dear friend... Captain Zach Hammer Miller of Throwdown Fishing Charters in Port St. Lucie, Florida, you would be correct. Okay? So seeing that movies for, for many people are kind of part of the holidays, right? I mean, there's like some tradition there. Everybody sits down at some point to watch the Christmas vacation and and die hard, I guess. Uh there's that whole social media debate over whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I don't I don't really care. I'm not a big die hard guy. Um, Anyway, it seemed like an appropriate time to have a jaunty Jaws discussion. It's winter, man. It's the holidays. There's downtime. And I bet that this puts a lot of you in the mood to grab your Snuggie, make some kettle corn, and settle in with the kids to listen to the soft gurgling sounds of young Alex Kintner's last breath as he gets eviscerated on his raft. Now, I I don't want to give too much away up front here because there's a lot to talk about. But look, suffice it to say... Um, that Zach and I have both done some things that sort of elevate our Jaws fan status, okay? Things that the average Jaws fan has not done and and cannot do. And as examples, like I've been out uh, with the captain that Quint was modeled after on the boat that the Orca was modeled after, okay? Zach has driven down a highway in Florida in a pickup truck with one of the shark heads from the film in the back, all right? Zach has put Quint's jacket that he wore in the movie on his body, on his person. He has worn it, okay? And then on like a way lesser note, uh, in terms of Jaws connection, uh, I won't lie. Every time I hear the line about Alex Kintner's mom putting an ad in Field and Stream, I totally do the doughboy giggle. I'm like, hmm, I work there. <laughs> but listen, so so we're clear. We're not trying to do like a shot by shot critique here, okay? We're not like breaking down every aspect of the film. This is a fishing podcast. And Zach and I consider Jaws the ultimate fishing movie, right? And the funny thing is, it's really not a fishing movie at all. That's the weird part. And a lot of the fishing stuff, as we'll be expanding on, was very wrong, right? But it doesn't matter. It's still the greatest fishing movie of all time, despite its flaws. Flaws that I think any angler, whether you've shark fished or not, will find interesting. Like, the next time that you watch this movie, you're going to know that the reel that Quint is using probably would have never handled a shark that big. 
So I'll tell you, like after Zach and I recorded this, uh, we, we were talking and he said, dude, you know, if you think about it, right, you and I probably would have never met had it not been for Jaws. And he's right. Jaws ultimately fueled his passion for targeting big sharks on the beach back in the day. Jaws fueled my passion for fishing in general. And then all those years later, when I wanted to try this whole land-based shark fishing thing, we end up finding each other. And 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 it's it's true. You know, if, if Jaws had never been made, would we have ended up on that beach together catching uh, a huge hammerhead, still the biggest fish I've ever caught in my life, on video um, so many years ago? You know, it's it's God, it's like borderline romantic, isn't it? And we're we're going to go a lot of directions uh, with this romance. OK, facts. Um, a Miller pod is like a labyrinth. OK, you take a wrong turn and suddenly you're on Swedish metal bands. But I've gotten pretty good at steering him. So we're going to drop some inside info on you about Jaws that you probably never knew, right? We're going to find out why you can't actually use piano wire as shark leader, okay? We're, you're you're going to find out who we think will play Quint when Hollywood inevitably remakes this movie. And you're going to find out firsthand what it's actually like to sit on one of the barrels used in the film and drink cheap, shitty beer. Hello? Hello? Is that you, Joey? It's me. How you doing, bud? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. It's just another beautiful day down here. America's heartland, so we call it South Florida. You <laughs> in America's heartland and nothing. You're in America's wiener down there dangling at the bottom. Hey, you watch your mouth. I am a real Florida man. If you Google that shit, I'm going to come up somewhere. So, <laughs> Yeah, you're going to come up somewhere. What are you up to? So let's um, let's divulge your personal life. I know you're stag right now because your girlfriend's up here in Jersey. So what what is it tonight? Yeah. What is it tonight? Tombstone Pizza? KFC? Actually... Oh, man. <laughs> this is a bad look. I got some Popeyes from last night thawing out on the counter right now, and I'm going to throw a Red Baron in the <laughs> oven after. Wait, is that an actual truth? Like, I just happened to say Tombstone and KFC, and you are legit eating leftover Popeyes and a Red Baron? Yeah. No, that's what's going to happen after this call. Damn. I am good. That was like a five moment, dude. You know what I mean? Like, somewhere like, we're and, and both even looking with- at the same Red Baron pizza. <laughs> yeah, what's even crazier about it, if you would have wanted to take it a step further, I got some uh, Trenton pork roll falling out in the fridge as well. Do you now? Where did that come from? You didn't fly that home uh, from your PJ, last visit here. No, no, no my mom smuggled a giant tube back, but uh, BJ's Wholesale over here actually has like the 10-pound uh, logs of them. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah, she scored one. I mean, Trenton's all right, but I mean, Taylor Ham's where it's at in reality. Oh. It, it's close. It's close, but Taylor Ham's better. Can we, we need to save that for a whole, every time, dude, every time, first of all, you realize you're like the Alec Baldwin of the Hookshots podcast? Like, you're the only person, this is like four times for you now. That's saying something. First of all, don't ever compare me to Alec Baldwin, <laughs> okay? Like, not him, not the fat Baldwin, not the sleepy looking one, just Keep the bald ones away from me. I'm way, 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 way more metal than those guys ever could be. That is so. Let's just yeah. Let's play that out. As far as appearances, um, I think this is number three. No, this number is number three. This is number four. If you consider your guest appearances in the Friends and Fans roundups. Um, no, that's the only one I, I only I only did one of those. I only did the uh, the Everglades Ghost Camp story. Nope, you did Everglades Ghost Camp. You did uh, getting hurt on the pier for our injuries one. Oh, I forgot about that. See, but my point is yeah. that every time I do a podcast with you, within the first two minutes, you say something that prompts me to say that could be a whole other podcast. In this case, the Taylor Ham pork roll debate, which is hot on the Hookshots Facebook page right now. By the way, is it really? It is. I, I, I missed out on that. It's hot everywhere else. Everybody from Jersey, everywhere I look, it's just like a fist fight over if it's pork roll or Taylor Ham. Right. And being in the household I grew up here in South Florida, we call it Taylor Ham. Okay. So well, yeah, that's you good. can take it for what it's worth. I never knew it as pork roll until you South Jersey guys kept kind of like beating it into my head and like Kerber has like 
his like eighth uncle like runs the factory or something. So there's like a statue of him in Trenton somewhere, something and like that. Yet he can never get his hands on free pork roll. That that doesn't make any sense to me. But I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it is expensive and it is a really really hard to come by and cherished item. I believe in the Trenton area, especially anything that has the Trenton name on it. I could understand why it's under such heavy security because that is a treasure there. It's kind of like the old Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle when they used to see him flying into Newark Airport. <laughs> yes. Yes to all the things you just said. Uh, but we're not talking Paps tonight. We're talking Narragansett. You know what I'm saying? Yo, what is up? Now you're speaking my language. Because we have been talking about doing this this particular topic, this podcast, for a while. And I think we just need to make it clear to everybody that this is not like two schmoes that play Dungeons and Dragons, like talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Like we have like deeper rooting in Jaws with things that we have done. Yeah, no, that's true. And uh, we brought this up uh, one time real briefly, you know, many, many, many moons ago. And then I got hit over the head with, hey, we're filming this Jaws podcast in a couple of days. I was like, oh, okay. And I, I totally forgot about it because it was only a two minute conversation six years ago. So, okay, well, you just you just shit on my whole idea that this is something we've been plotting and planning for a while. Well, no, that's fine, but I mean, it's not like this isn't in our heads, though. It's in our heads, it's in our hearts, and <laughs> it's in our souls, and that's all that really matters when it comes down to it. So, uh, you want to talk Jaws? You want to talk Quint? You want to talk Never about Ben Gardner's head? Fire away. Shoot from the hip, buddy. Well, I think I think it is fair to say that the reason we're doing this is because as far as I'm concerned, like um, I've done many roundups like for Field and Stream over the years, like the, the, the best fishing books ever, the best fishing movies ever. And like this is the best fishing movie ever, even though it's not ever. really a fishing movie, if you really stop and think about it. The fishing is so minimal. And I think one of the fun things to discuss is that so much of it is – wrong but it is still the greatest fishing movie ever yeah and y you won't hear any debate about that from me i mean there's a couple that people want to try to throw out there what's the one with the the, the guy that used to be hot that everybody talks about um <laughs> brad pitt a river yeah, run, yeah, a river yeah, runs yeah. through it yeah a river runs through it i mean if you really want to, i mean okay he learned how to cast a fly rod for that cool like i did that too in a park in a couple of hours like, and I get it. I mean, I guess it's kind of fishing centric, and it's probably more fishing centric than even Jaws is. But at, at, like at the same time, like you're talking about, you know, Taylor Ham and Pork Roll. Who Taylor Ham's obviously better, though they're kind of the same. And if you look at it, like, okay, Brad Pitt was throwing a fly rod, and then you got Robert Shaw in Jaws. But like, Jaws is like the movie seven if we're going to compare brad pitt to stuff Fair. a river runs through it's not even in the same demo R but i do agree with you though however it is not actually a fishing movie and it's hardly fishing centric but it's probably the most widely identified fishing movie available oh uh, dude uh, 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 yes a hundred percent right it's kind of like the river monsters like like fishermen like that, but they also just like to tear Jeremy Wade apart for all the things he does wrong. But then you have to step yeah. back and go, that's not actually a fishing show. Like, it's not really yeah, a could... fishing show. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it definitely isn't. It's more of a drama. And I could sit here and do a nine-hour podcast ripping that guy to pieces. Like, oh, my God, what happened to this beluga? This this assailant was nibbling on people's toes in the pond in Ronkonkoma. And it's like, it turns out it's this killer bluegill, you know? Like... Oh, cool. Like, now, like, you can only have so many animals to try to hype up as a fear thing, you know? Okay. But I get it. It's TV and, you know, Jaws. <laughs> Jaws is the greatest. Jaws is the goat. And it holds a place special in my heart because even when I was a child, like, I remember watching that when I was like, I can't even give you an age. All my childhood's kind of blurry, maybe from the lead that hit me in the head at the pier. But, like, it, 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 even when I was a kid, I was, like, devastated when Quint died in that movie. No yeah. spoilers, but, you know, 40 years, come on, people, <laughs> no, get with it. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> no, there cannot be anybody listening to this that hasn't seen Jaws. And if uh, you you'd be surprised. It, but if you uh, haven't actually. seen it, why would you listen to this? That would be like me listening yeah, to true. a podcast about Steel Magnolias or something. But you know what? Wait, to, before we get too far ahead, I was going to ask you, like, I don't have a recollection of the first time that I saw that movie, but I do, I, and that's because I was, 
like too, way too young to see it. But you want to talk right. about like today's kids and parents versus us. I got Jaws on VHS in my stocking when I was young enough to still f***ing believe in Santa Claus. Because I remember taking it oh, wow. out of the stocking and going, how did the elves paint Chrissy Watkins' nude boobies so perfectly? Like, this looks oh, wow. this looks just like the same one that we rent in Blockbuster Video. And, huh. like, that's, in a nutshell, what's wrong with America these days? Nobody is giving their six-year-old or seven-year-old kid a copy of Jaws. No, and that's a microcosm of a much, much bigger issue that we are moving <laughs> full steam ahead into in the 2020 decade. Um, I don't even, I, I'm just going to throw on the, I don't even want to get in near that right now. That's fair. That's I, fine. I, I, we don't yeah, have to lose all credibility with most people that probably listen to this and my house might be incinerated. That's so, fine. We, look, it, we, yes. And, and, and you've actually just said enough without going off in that direction. Yeah. Cause that could, that could take us down a rabbit hole. I just don't have time for But my, but my yeah. point is like, I saw that movie very young and it never scared me. Like, I always just thought it was cool. I never was scared by it. I remember, you know, within a couple of years, like, my godfather giving me the Jaws movie poster for my birthday. Like, I had the Jaws movie poster hanging in my room when I was eight years old. Now, I don't know about you, but, like, I oh, wow. I played Jaws. Like, I played Jaws. Like, my couch was the orca. Like, I played Jaws when I was little. I did similar things on the playground in elementary school and that goes up to fifth grade. So I could at least remember bits and pieces going back to that. And like, I even had one of my cousins in New Jersey when I was a child up there, probably seven or eight years old, gave me, uh, uh, what was it? One of the, uh, regular Nintendo jaws games to oh, give me God. so I could play when I came home. Unbeatable, terrible Most game. game that's <laughs> ever been played ever. Like I could only shoot so many arrows at stingrays and f***ing conch shells. And, and, and no matter what submarine you're in, the shark still f***ing eats you. You're shooting missiles at the goddamn thing. And it was just unbeatable. And you put a tracking beacon on it that didn't f***ing work. And next thing you know, your sailboat's sunk in f***ing Grand Bahama. And you're like, f*** me. Like, now what? It's like, who's going to pay for this? Uh, well, I didn't even really put it together until many years later that that was based off Jaws the Revenge. Jaws 4. Right, which yeah, I saw the in the one theater. That cares about. Yeah, but dude, my dad took me to see Jaws four in the theater. Like I, I, I was old enough for that. I remember watching it on on VHS, Blockbuster, and renting it though at a well, very how, young age. How, how old are you right now? Thirty. <laughs> Thirty. <Two? Eight. laughs> You're only a couple <laughs> years younger than me, but I I do remember what Jaws four was like eighty seven ish. I remember going yeah, I think to see it was like that. 87, 88. Yeah, I remember going to see that in the theater, and then the, the, the video game, the Nintendo game, came out uh, that year, and I could only ever beat it with Game Genie. I beat it one time, but I had oh, you to cheater. Yeah, exactly. I had to use the f-ing Infinite Lives, man. It was the only way. It was yeah, an awful I watched game. It on YouTube a couple years ago, like a game playthrough. I just went down one of those rabbit holes and like beat it, but like he must have had Game Genie. Like there was no way you could beat that shark. It was ridiculous. You could kill the little sharks, but it would take nine million arrows, but <laughs> Like, once the big one came lurking around with that different music, you were just toast. You just had to hug the bottom and, like, fire some shots at it and hope it didn't eat you off the bottom. Like, it, it, but, yeah, that's how far, you know, at least I go back. I mean, obviously, I was I was just born when Jaws Revenge would hit the theater, right. that, if, if it was, like, 88. Right, so, right, like, right. Yeah, you know, you're, it, it, yeah. It, it, yeah, no, and it, it really stands to a testament of how long that movie that brand has been around and like let, let's just get this off the table too before we go any further jaws two three four garbage we're not talking about any of that no like, it's no absolutely worthless it's a waste of time and it, I, it like it, they ruined the brand like two was like kind of okay it's like a say, band that like their first album was two. awesome and then their second one was like kind of okay but you saw where the ship was going the mainstream <laughs> and then it just crashed from there on out was it was like say, metallica's black <laughs> album like <laughs> jaws 2 popped up on cable not long ago and i got sucked into it just because it had been so many years since i'd seen it yeah it's always on it's yeah. always on and, like it's always jaws one and then two and then you'll never see three or four anywhere near any even shitty channel. No, and no, no, no. Jaws we, three never happens anywhere. But I was going to say, you know what I think it was about Jaws two that made it tolerable? It had the because same. Brody was in it. Well, Brody was in it, but it was the same 
look and Steady. feel and same place. Like it felt like at least they connected. And after that, shit just mm-hmm. went completely rogue. Just went. Well, now you got this shark that's stalking the Brody family thousands of miles down the coast. That was the common theme through three and four too. Exactly. And, and it's like I think it was following the kid Michael or something. Yeah. That, yeah, and then the mom came back for four, some stupid, and they're on a sailboat, and they're eating abalone. I don't know. It was <laughs> stupid. But, yeah, you know, back to the nuts and bolts of what makes this work. Well, the nuts, like, the nuts I mean, I, I just, my point is, right, that this feels like a lame thing to say. Like, when people say th- this stuff, like, in another realm, I'm like, oh, God, man, whatever. But, like, that was so influential on me. When I was little, like I, it just, it solidified just my love of sharks and fishing, like to a, to a degree, like Jaws played like a huge role in my love of fishing because even later, like after the revenge came out, I remember they did a tour where they took the shark from the revenge, like all over the country. My parents took me to see that in Atlantic city oh, wow. It was on display at like, you know, Trump Taj Mahal or something or showboat or something in AC. And, like, we, well, of course. Like even on my family boat, like, growing up in the 90s, like, when nobody was looking, I was, like, like hooking harnesses to, like, old Penn senators and shit and, like, sitting on the back and, like, making a fighting chair and, like, tying the string to the swim platform. Like, I don't know, dude. The first tattoo I ever got was a great white, which ultimately goes back to jaw. Like, it was just a love of sharks from that you movie. you have a great white tattoo? I do. I have a great white tattoo, believe it or not. It was a birthday present oh, wow. when I turned 18. Wow, how about that? I only have one tattoo, and it's a giant tattoo of Sean Connery's face on my chest. No, you but, don't. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Come on, Joey. I mean, mm. but I mean, getting back to, to it, like, it, it, I was doing a lot of the same stuff. I never got to go to see any Jaws tours or anything because we're Florida. Nobody comes down to America's wang for anything. <laughs> Let's drive shit like shit on our roads right now. And, like, <laughs> but it was this. Same thing. Like I was absolutely fascinated by that. Like I was fascinated for, by sharks. Like because I was like old enough to remember the first Shark Week that ever hit the yeah. air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my parents used to videotape it for me on VHS. And like Shark Week, from from what it has been the last like fifteen years to what it started out as, people's heads would explode if they saw what they were watching back then. Right. And like I remember them doing stuff on, um, what was that crazy? Yeah, so be from Australia. Dick Hislop. Uh-huh. He was the yeah. leg- legendary shark hunter down in Australia. And that dude would go out there, and they had Shark Week episodes of this dude and his catamaran that had shark jaws hanging all over it. And he would go out with harpoon guns and harpoon stingrays on the flats and dolphin and drag them back and put, it on, put them on chain and drum lines and catch these massive tigers in white yeah. and go back, drag them back to the beach and hang them from cranes. It was friggin' insane. Insane, man. Like, I wish I still could find some of that stuff just to watch it because it was that loony of crap to watch. Like, you're just like, this is awesome. Yeah. Well, like, the- it wouldn't fly in this day and age, but like back in the early 90s, like, this is it. Like, it would be incredible to watch right now if somebody put that out there. Like, yeah, I, I mean, but it just goes to show. I, I, I don't remember that as vividly as, as you do, but I remember those shows too. And I mean, like, um, just the 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 treatment of sharks in jaws probably for the wrong reasons but like had such a lasting effect like i couldn't wait for somebody to buy me a set of shark teeth like i like i had to yep. have that hanging in my room my dad ended up buying them for me like a big set and like put them on a plaque and like burn jaws underneath them you know like that hanging them at the dock the first Fish I yeah. ever caught in salt water was a, a you know shitty sand t- uh, tiger not tiger shark um, dog tiger dog shark? not a tiger uh, shark a dogfish uh-huh. um, um, we called them sand sharks but it was a dogfish and like yeah like I had to come back and hang that at the dock of our boat and ultimately because of Jaws you know yeah and I will tell you this there is not one piece of film or film adaptation, or television show, or anything, that has caused more environmental damage than Jaws did. Yeah. Uh, And, like, back in the 70s, after that happened, in the 80s, there were shark tournaments that popped up all over the state of Florida. Yeah. And you could go down there and see sharks hang. They would just leave them to rot on the side of the road. And 
it, it caused an absolute environmental phenomenon by media. And right. that's the only thing I could even remember that, like, a movie caused damage for something that vividly that, like, it it decimated certain populations of sharks. <laughs> well, sure, dude. Are you, I mean, you want to talk about PC then versus now, right? I don't even know, like, and, and you and I are both pretty well versed in, in, like, the history of the movie, which we'll certainly get into a little bit. But, like, uh, the tiger shark that is hanging dead in that movie Somebody mm-hmm. called somebody in Florida and was like, "Yeah, we, we shipped up. We need a tiger shark. Like that was not a prop. Like somebody in Florida killed that shark, put it in a cardboard box, and like trucked it up to Martha's Vineyard for that scene. I mean, never in a yeah. million years. Now, you know, no, you could never do anything like that now. I mean, even like a what was it, the Apocalypse Now movie where they butcher the live cow on screen, right? Like, yeah, that's I forget the name." Of guy who caught the shark and they they just you know somebody knew somebody who knew somebody you know i think that fish came from the west coast of florida and they shipped it up there in like two or three days on a semi and it was just like half rotten i mean that's yeah. a real shark like, yeah it wasn't yeah thing, like, okay that's a real shark I, I, rem- I remember reading because like even when i was a kid i remember looking at it and like they have its mouth open and you don't really see any teeth and it looks all drippy and shitty and nasty and then i read about it later and i'm like yeah because it yeah. was half rotten like they didn't have refrigeration. They just like threw it in a pickup and drove it up there. Yeah, no, they just threw it on ice blocks and a tarp and said, "Good luck." You yeah. know? <laughs> and it, it, but yeah, the, I mean that's essentially how it went. But it, like, no, go ahead. No, I was gonna say like I've been to that spot. I've also done the dorky like Martha's Vineyard Jaws tour, and uh, the funny thing about that is the locals up there, especially back then, like Jaws was a huge pain in the ass. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't love it. Like, no, that yeah, whole I'm thing sure took was. over that island, and they, they didn't love it. But, like, so along the lines of that sort of insider deal with, with the shark being real, like, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Because to look at Jaws from a fishing perspective, you know, I had said that, like, you know, we bring a little bit more to the table than just being fanboys. Like, you uh, have some history, correct, with the guy who has the biggest Jaws memorabilia collection, Right. I do. All right, you do. You also uh, did a hell of a lot more shark fishing for big fish than I ever did, so you can actually speak to the true validity of some of the gear that is used in Jaws. And I fished, kind of, there's an asterisk there, uh, with Frank Mundus, Captain Frank Mundus, who was the inspiration for Quint. I mean, he was kind of the guy that set it all off. He made his living hiking yeah. sharks as monsters, taking people out to kill sharks, which really affected Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws. And, like, I spent the day on a, on a boat with that dude. Yeah, and what's kind of sad about that whole thing is how Frank Mundus, being the pioneer of that whole you know, thing that he was, like... Peter Benchley, to the day he died, did not give that guy an ounce of credit yeah. for basing that guy off of. And Frank Mundus will tell you, well, he would have told you because he's a friend of mine, and I have links to Mundus as well. And he said that, you know, wait, like it was like five or six years before the movie came out that Peter Benchley chartered him for a day out yep. of Montauk. Yep. And he sat on the boat with a pad and a paper, and he didn't want to fish, and he let other people fish and do something else. He just wrote all this stuff down in a notebook and left, and then he ended up writing the movie John. Yeah, and most of Frank's remaining life was him fighting that to be like, okay, like I'm the original yeah. monster man. And like, if if you know anything about Mundus or look anything about him up and research him online and how much of a badass dude that guy actually was, and like you look at that guy's boat and it's the cricket. Like, right. no, I'm not the cricket. The orca. His boat was the cricket. Right. And yeah. Like the whole thing, you're like, this is ridiculous, man. Like, and you know, and, and he was taught, and Quinn, even in the movie, oh, just gonna, those jaws came off a 16 footer out of Montauk, right. you know, like the, the whole thing, the fact that Benchley went to the grave not giving that guy credit is a travesty by itself. Well, you know? I, I gotta and tell you, it's kind of how most. The, no, I was going to say, say, the day that we, that we fished, that we chartered, it was really rough that day. We ended up getting turned around. And, I mean, Mundus just basically sat there and, and pushed his books and, and pushed sales and, and basically shit on everything to do with Jaws. I mean, if you were like, what do you think about that harpoon gun? It was shit. What do you think about this? It was stupid. He's like, he's like I walked out of the theater the first time I saw Jaws laughing my ass off. Like, he was 
bitter, man. I mean, very bitter. Same time, you know, they he came back to Montauk for what was it, the 30th anniversary of the film, something like that. I mean, so he used it at the same time, but then when you talked about it with him, he was extremely bitter. Yeah, I mean, and you know, when you got a legacy that's built kind of on that, but I mean, he built it himself. They just kind of capitalized off of him, and he never saw a dime from any of the sales of any of that stuff. Right. And I, I would be bitter too, you know? I mean, there's a lot of people out there trying to capitalize on other people's stuff and just not, you know, want to pay for it. And that guy, imagine on a magnitude of that, you're talking one of the probably 30 best movies ever made. Right. Like, right. And, and like, you know, that's a hell of a thing. Like, you know, uh, Shark 3D Spring Break on sci fi. <laughs> like, it, 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 it's, 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 in Jaws, and at the end of the day, like, and I was just watching, like, I don't watch it that often, but once in a while, I'll get sucked into it again, and I make, you know, Megan watch it with me, and every time I watch it, the older I get, I don't get the same feeling as I did when I was younger watching it, like, oh, I want to go out and do. catch these sharks. No, I, I don't, because I, I guess I kind of did it as kind of jerk off as that is to say. No, I know. I, yeah, I know what you mean. You you did. You spent a lot of times like, catching big, a lot of time catching big sharks. Yeah, and like that movie had a lot to do with it, as well as Mundus and many other things. But like going back there and you 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 watch that movie and the simplicity of the actual movie is it, it really is simple. All the shots are simple. Yeah. And everything else, but it makes it so friggin' creepy for some reason. Yeah. And like and like it's forty how old is it now? Is it forty, forty five years? Well like, like the thirtieth anniversary was oh five, forty so yeah, forty five cre- years. Creeping up on forty five years, yeah. Forty five years and like I watch that movie still and I'm like just so a Especially the scenes when they're all out on the orca. Yeah. And just the quietness of almost everything that happens out there. And just like, it, like it, some of the shots, the whole thing is just creepy. And I'll say this, too. It's 45 years later, and there's been tons of shark movies that have been made. And everyone laughs at every single one of them. Right. And nobody laughs at Jaws. And as stupid as that shark looks... That shark looks more real than any of the CGI shit that yeah. they've done in 50 years. Yeah, well, which, um, which begs the question, because I was going to kind of close with this, but I'll ask it now. I mean, I'm just cringing at the thought, like, you know, Hollywood, I think, is out of ideas. Do you ever see this movie getting they're remade? They're remaking everything. It terrifies me. Yeah, because I, I don't know, dude. I, like, that's one that I just feel so strongly needs to be left alone. I think certain movies should not be touched, and I know they've remade a bunch of Thank God they're still stuck on comic books for the last 10 years on a rut, just spinning tires on that garbage. But, like, if they did do it, I think they would nuke it. But I do think there's a couple people that you, if they did insert the right people, I think it could possibly work. But if they did it in a modern era, it would not work. Like, if they tried to do, like, a 2015 and everything's 2015 and stuff, or 2019, jeez. Um, God, who would they, like, who would they imagine, pull to play, to play Quint right now? Can you even imagine? I already know the answer to that. I think that's the easiest one of all of them. Really? Enlighten me. Yep. Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> I'm serious, man. That guy, if there's one person on planet Earth that could pull it off, it could be that guy. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I laughed at you, and now I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, F- he's right. He's right. Yeah, because, because, because guy, he I mean, only plays about, like the like, most emotional, powerful, dark. like yeah, yeah. And that he's the only guy, and he has the look too. Like if you've seen him in Gangs of New York or There Will Be Blood or something like that, like he's halfway to Quint right there. Like, and. I think he's the only one, but as far as like a Chief Brody, like nerdy cop guy or Hooper book guy, like I don't know who would be able to play either of those. It would, but, be, it would be like um, Seth Rogen playing playing Hooper. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. It would probably be somebody like that, a Seth Rogen, but like a Chief Brody, like he's kind of like, but then again, people don't act like that anymore. No, they don't. Like, I don't see many movies, like I haven't in like 10 years that I thought was like this was oh yeah I've seen a couple but uh, every one of them I think has had Christian Bale in it <laughs> he's good man and you know what that's another part he might be able to do a, a, a Chief Brody man 
All right, you got this shit all figured out. I just, I, I don't yeah, because but like, then you it throw just pains a CGI me. shark in and a new and a and a, and a sixty foot hatteras. <laughs> <That's laughs> over like, like a contender like, with tricks right yeah, there. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the uh, what was the one? Uh, Quadzilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody seen Quadzilla? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis is out there chasing jaws on him. Like <laughs> Dude, every, t- every time I think of Daniel Dave Lewis, I just think of Beavis and Butthead referring to him as Daniel Dave Lewis. Did he real? Was he around that long? Yeah, man, he's been around. I think I'm pretty sure it was Beavis and Butthead. Daniel Dave Lewis wasn't that Beavis and Butthead? I don't know. I, I wasn't really in that Beavis and Butthead era. I was like right on the tail end of that. All right. Well. All right. All right. Well, so this this is this is a good segue because if they remade Jaws, I'm sure they would just googan the fishing up uh, very bad. And like we said, this is not really a fishing movie, but yeah, if you break it down as a fisher person, it's actually like a lot of fun. So like uh, if you've been following us on social. Um, not that long ago, I got my hands on a 16-0 Penn Senator, which was, yeah, was quite yeah. real. I got that from a, a benefactor, and he or yeah. she, he or she has asked to remain nameless. But as a vintage tackle collector, and more importantly, a Jaws fan, that's like my holy grail piece of vintage tackle. Now, to me, I don't really care about the guts. I don't really care what it can do. It's just this giant paint can size. Real weighs four thousand pounds, and it's a collection thing for me. But like, interestingly, you know that was that was the reel that starts clicking for Quint when he, he hooks the mystery fish there in the beginning. But you like grew up using fourteen O's, and you've told me that actually the sixteen O was not a very good reel, right? No, it definitely wasn't. Um, I had a sixteen O at one point. I would like to get another one, but everybody wants an arm and a leg for it now. Right. Hold on a second. There you go. There's one of the 14s in the garage right now. Oh, that's that, a, okay. Yeah, no, I still got them on deck. Uh, they're collecting a lot of dust these days. But, like, you know, everything's moved so far past the Senators now because of the Tiagras and the a- Avit and the Everwalls well, and Accurate everybody's fishing. But, like, there's the, the simplicity of the Senator and the usefulness of it is is it's timeless. Like, you can't break those 14-0s and you can't break the 10 Senators. But the 12 Senators... And the sixteen O senators are garbage. Like, like now, I'm now, just now, call now, one now, now, why? Because see, I, one of the reasons I think it's so hard to find a vintage sixteen O is because I understand it. Even back in the day when they were producing them, that was a special order thing. Like most tackle shops didn't have that. You'd have to go to a pen dealer and say, "Can you get me a sixteen O?" So you tell me yeah, why, and it, why were they not that good? Okay, here's how this kind of worked: a sixteen O is a 14-0 senator that is just a wide spool version of it. Right. Besides the spool and the frame post and the cross members, if you take those side plates and gears from a 14-0 and you have a spool for a 16-0, you could put it on there and it's the same reel. Right. But the problem with the 16-0 is because it is a wider version of it, they're not balanced correctly. So if you put a lot of torque on that thing, the line gets to one side of the reel or starts packing onto one side. At some point, the spools can spread on those things. You don't get as much cranking power because it's not top heavy and narrow. Right. It's wide. So you're putting more strain on the gears and the gear bridges wear out on them and where the handle is. You could move the handle back and forth and they just don't have cranking power. And because of the lack of cranking power, because of the shape and dimensions of it, it ends up being a problem down the road at some point. And yours, may, you should shake yours around. You, you, your gear bridge might be shot in that one, too. If you could move the handle horizontally, not up and down, but horizontally, there's a lot of play in it. That gear bridge is stripped out because of somebody putting pressure on it at some point. I, I, you know, I might go shake it, but I, I don't really care. It's just sitting there all over. No, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't, mean, I don't really yeah, care. But, but see, this is what I'm talking about. Like, that's right there. Boom. That's the f***ing Jaws info that you're not going to get anywhere else, right? So the next time you watch no, Jaws sir. and you see that giant reel and him strap into it, now you know that if he was actually fighting a 25-foot great white with that reel, that <laughs> reel probably would not have held up, right? No. No. More than likely it wouldn't have. Okay, so how about this one? I know you'll know this. This is a little Jaws Insider because you have to have, like, the special edition DVD. But one of one of my favorite scenes ever that didn't actually make it in the movie is the music store scene. You know what I'm talking about, right? 
Uh, what scene again? The music store scene where where Quint goes into the music store. Oh yeah, where he goes into. Yeah, where he goes to buy the piano wire. Right. So they they left that out of the original movie, but he, he goes in and he's 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 making fun of a kid playing a recorder in the music store. But he goes in As there. He should. Yeah, he should. <laughs> but he goes in to buy five spools of piano wire number twelve. So I mean, I don't really know the gauge of that. I don't really know how accurate that would be, but it's gotta be thicker. I, I would hope if they're trying to be accurate, it's got to be thicker or something than the steel fishing wire available in the day. What do you know about it? Uh, I actually have had a couple of different spools of piano wire in my hands in the how, past. And why? And, I am not surprised. There you go. Yeah, I don't remember how or where it came up. I think I was trying, because that's when I was like super broke, and I was like trying to find cheaper ways and even <laughs> buying fishing single-strand wire. <laughs> and you know, when you're sleeping on a pier, you got 10 bucks to your name for three days. <laughs> you know, yeah. Every penny counts. Three dollars isn't what it was. But um, I, I came across them somewhere. I forgot how. And from what I remember, the piano wire was actually thicker gauge than the shark wire was a lot of it okay. that we used. Okay. And but the problem with the piano wire is it comes in a very small tight coil. All the ones that I've seen, at least, I'm not piano guy. I'm not Billy Joel, so don't quote me. Right. But, but without, so I don't you say with, I without thought, without putting tension on it in the piano, it's going to have a shitload of memory, isn't it? Yeah, t- tons. And like w- I remember uncoiling it, and it was like a three inch wide coil, and it was like a slinky. There was no way you could straighten this stuff out without extreme tension, and that's not practical to fish with. Right. Because if you put a bait out there and you got a 10-foot leader, but it slinkies into one foot, a fish is going to come by and bite that and just bite your leader completely off. You're right. done. Like, right. Or it's going to kink when it comes tight. One of those coils will come to a bend from the quick motion and just kink itself off at some point. Right. Right, so piano wire, like we're doing a little myth busting here. So piano wire, uh, pro- that also probably not the thing to use. Uh, you know what? It might have been what Mundus was using. Though. I mean, maybe you could get it in the right school. Or I don't know if he was crimping cable way back then. It's hard to say. Right. But I'm sure you do a little research. It's possible because I mean, people were using something to catch those sharks, and they sure. weren't using monofilament. Sure. Sure. So, Sure. Well, dude, so another one, another one that that always gets me, right? And I, 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 like one of the coolest scenes, well, like, is when we first meet Quentin. We're in that shack, and there's the, the the shark jaws hanging everywhere, and he he opens the steaming pot and pulls out the two shark jaws that oh, are boiling God. away in uh, there. What uh, happens if you boil shark jaws? Let me tell you something. The there t- has been no. Go ahead. Yeah. No. There. Yeah. There has been no movie on planet Earth that has ruined more trophy shark jaws than jaws has. <laughs> if you boil and, shark like, jaws, it, the teeth just fall out. Yeah, you just boil it, and it, it because the only bone that is in a shark's body, technically, is the teeth. Right. Everything else is made of cartilage. I'm not saying you can't find it fossilized or whatever, and I, yeah, blah, blah, I get it. I'm not a fossil hunter. It's not Jurassic Park, but the deal is, if you boil it, the teeth are all coming out because it just turns into rubber in yep. the jaw. It's worthless. And like when I used to kill sharks many, many years ago when I was a kid, as we still didn't really know better, we were kind of like right on the precipice of not killing them at that point. Like I would do shark jaws all the time and it is a pain in the ass to do. It is. And, Oh, it, it is. I've cleaned many jaws, and you know, i got to hang them on the fence and tie them there. i got raccoons trying to rip them off the fence at nighttime because they got to stay on the fence in the position you want them to for like a month for the cartilage to harden. After you go through the hobby night and take every piece of feet off that thing as best you can. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is, it is a chore, and then I, I've only ever done it once. And you're right. If you don't, if you don't make that cartilage keep its shape while it's drying, that's why you see a lot of like old school Mako. They get real narrow and like real puckered and weird looking. But when I when I was a little kid, because you don't know any better, I assumed like that's what you do with shark teeth. You boil them. And I remember years ago when I still had my boat before they before they closed uh, brown sharking, where you could still keep one. We'd keep a brown shark or two a year. They were actually pretty good on the grill. I mean, they were crazy. There were shitloads of them around here. And uh, I had some kids out on the boat, and we caught a small one, and they wanted the teeth so bad. 
and you know you had the jaw and then you put it in a pot of boiling water but the teeth are so tiny that like you literally like i like ran my finger around the bottom of the pot and like i was like here's here's your teeth you know what i mean like they just fall right out yeah you know so that was like um that's like one of the biggest blunders in in the movie if you're a shark huge, fisherman, in huge. my opinion you know? yeah yeah and I mean, not many people are doing that anymore. That's probably more of like a localized Northeast thing now, or yeah. maybe some places in California, because most people are not killing sharks anymore. Like right. that has changed tremendously. Which is, which is great. Yeah, and, the attitude has changed completely. Oh, totally, a hundred percent. And like, don't get me wrong. Like, I wish I had a bunch more shark jaws because I used to get them and just give them away to people. Right. And it was just like, yo, I'm the cool kid. I would walk around high school and give out shark jaws to people. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing that happened. Like, I handed at least, like, five or six out while I was in high school. Like, and, the people that wanted oh, them, or just, sidebar. like, the hot girl in the class? Uh, it was both. It was both. But, fun sidebar, one of the old deans, he was one of the assistant principals in high school, he used to fish and spear fish and stuff, and he actually moved up to my town, and I ran into him weight fishing, like, four years ago, fishing in front of his dock. <laughs> okay. I hadn't seen him in, like, nine years, but... um. I told, we killed a black tip one night and somebody wanted one and everybody talks about how like good they are on the grill, but you know, you soak them in coke and for three days and yeah. light a candle and do, and say, <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Like, uh, I'm not anything that takes that much work, but I had one and I had all these things poured up into a bunch of steaks and like a whole midsection. It was probably like a 90 pound fish and then it would cord it out and stuff. It wasn't big. It was like five foot. Right. And, I just ha I got kicked out of class or something, and I went to his office because he used to not write me up. He just wanted to hang out, <laughs> and he he he's like I have this black tip or something. He's like, I'll bring it in. I'll, I love black tip. I'll bring it like whatever. So I showed up at school the next morning with a trash bag full of black tip <laughs> and like a black trash bag just with everything but the head inside of it, <laughs> and just walked through the courtyard in Boca Raton, Florida, and he <laughs> handed it to him, and he put it in like the faculty fridge. <laughs> Oh, I forgot about God. that. Well, there you go, yeah. hey, man. That's what we do. We we, yeah. we spark memories. That's what we do. So, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> so the the other one too, right? I remember very clearly. I think everybody is really intrigued by the harpoon gun in that movie, which I happen right. to know belonged to a local fisherman on Martha's Vineyard. Right, uh, Arthur Ben David was the guy's name, and somebody from production came to him and said. You know, what do you use to harpoon sharks? And he's like, well, everybody these days is using these guns, and I have one if you want to borrow it. And that was the gun that ended up being in the movie. They borrowed it for the entire mm. shoot. And that, that, that gun was British-made. It's a greener, light harpoon gun. And fun fact, it's a, it's a forty five caliber blank that fires the, the dart. And yeah. Mundus said that they were absolutely worthless. They were absolutely terrible, mm. and even the guy in the book who lent them the harpoon gun said that he'd only used it once before he lent it to them, and he shot a blue shark with it, and it was so powerful that the dart just went straight through and kept right on going. Like it, it oh, that's it, pretty cool. Yeah, like it did. It didn't really do its job, you know. But I mean, well, I, like when were they popular in shark fishing? Because I knew a lot of shark guys. Growing up, and even never. now, like nobody, <laughs> like they have bang sticks. No, I never but heard of that. But, but I'll tell you right now, that put Quint's badass factor up to eleven. Oh, just because he's, he's just, oh, for sure. But like the dude who has the biggest Jaws memorabilia collection, he has the harpoon gun. Right. Let's get into that because and, you sent me pictures. Not spoiler alert. Like I had no idea that you have actually put on your body, on your person, Quint's hat and jacket. Like, are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's a thing that happened. And uh, he let me wear it. I had to coax him for like four days to let me do it. And he finally let me put it on. And like, if you look at the picture of me, like I've never looked more like a f***ing nerd than I did in that picture. <laughs> like, and that was a good nine years ago now. How and did like, you meet this guy? Like, you got to tell me the backstory because okay, well, I don't really know it. Yeah. My, fr yeah, my friend, Sean and Brooks Paxton, who were on Discovery Channel for a special uh, called How Jaws Changed the World, and they were featured on that. Right. So yeah. they'd be good people to talk to. Yeah. Um, 
and they have a long history with Frank Mundus, and they started some shark tournament called the Ultimate Shark Challenge that Guy Harvey was sponsoring. And there was like four or five tournaments over the course of five years that we held in Southwest Florida, and then we did two that were in Montauk. Right. And before the whole, whole thing fizzled out. And um, they they tried to have a whole festival around it. Not tried, they did. Like two of the years, there was like a festival and a jumbotron because the whole thing was all these sharks were released. And we had chase boats out there with satellite tracking tags to, to pick a shark if they could get there in time, if it was the right, whatever they were looking for. Right. Tag it. We were live streaming it to the people at the festival on a jumbotron and then you could track the shark through the O-Search website for right. however long that lasted. I remember this, It yeah. was a pretty wild concept, yeah. yeah, and way ahead of its time. And um, they knew the guy Chris Kishka uh, from Montauk, because when they, because when they went to go uh, repossess uh, Mundus's boat that had been stolen and missing or whatever it was, and they helped bring it back from North Carolina or where, or I think it was North Carolina. Yeah, it was North Carolina. To Montauk. And they redid the boat and they filmed this whole thing. They have all this footage just sitting in a locker somewhere that hasn't seen the light of day mm. in 15 years. And it was Mundus' last trip on his boat, the cricket shark fishing. Mm. And yeah, it's pretty wild. And, and Kishka ended up. That's the guy with the Jaws collection and ended up getting into it. They heard like word of mouth because he was in New York too. So he came down and they became friends down there with Mundus. And he, he, they had pictures of Mundus wearing Quince jackets st- sitting on the barrels and stuff. Really? And oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now there's tons of stuff, man. And, um, so they, a few years passed by, the opportunity came up, and they actually paid to ship his collection down to this festival for two years in a row to display it for the people at Punta Gorda who came to the Shark Fest or whatever we called it. I forgot the name of it. Right. And, you know, Kishka, he was a cool dude, and he was, um, he, I think he still is, a bouncer for, like, metal and rock acts. Like, he was doing, like, Lita Ford and Jim Gillette for years, <laughs> like, as their bodyguard. Awesome. And he looks like a six-foot eight. Let me kill Mister. <laughs> yeah, and he's a cool dude. Like whatever. And like I had to transport. We we had to transport most of the Jaws memorabilia around ourselves to get it set up. So like we threw Bruce was the name of the shark. Yeah. That's what everybody on the set called the actual animatronic monster shark for some reason. And they called it Bruce, and he has one of the Bruce heads. It's not the whole shark or the, the moving one, right. but it's one of the heads. And we had to transport it somewhere, and it was huge. It was still like 10 foot tall. And we had Bruce's head in the back of my buddy's truck, and we were driving over a causeway in Puna Gorda, uh, the Peace River Causeway, and the thing almost flew out of the back of our truck into traffic. <laughs> And yeah, it was sketchy, man. It started like lifting up, and I'm like, dude, if this thing hits the pavement, just keep driving. We're never coming back. <laughs> like, just, like, I'm not sitting there for the rest of that, but it ended up leveling itself off. And he did the stuff. He had the barrels, he had the harpoon gun in the case, um, he had the shark cage, he had the dive suit, he had the dive tanks, he had oh Ben Gardner's God. head. Um, he had, he has the 16 on the rod, but I looked on a website. Like just a few days ago, and there was a debate about it, and somebody was saying that the original one, that was one of like two that was moved used in the movie, but like the I guess the original one ended up getting fished on a boat or something really? after the movie was filmed. That's what somebody in a pen collectors group said. So I don't know how factual it is or not. Kish claims that's the original one. It sure looks like it, but I can't confirm or deny. But the, the dude had some strong facts to back it. Sure, and it's on a Fenwick um, rod, right? It's a Fenwick that Quince used in the movie. It's on Fenwick with Mildrum roller guides. And, um, you know, I, I I got pictures of me holding the rod, and then after like four days of hounding him and freaking getting friends, I'm like, dude, oh my, just let me wear it. Let me put it on, man. And did you, did you smell like, it? Did you, did you smell it? Lean in and smell it? I don't remember sniffing. It, but I remember when I w- went to go put the army jacket on it in the back in a permanent marker written crudely. It says R. Shaw in it. No and, shit. Yeah, and I put it on. The hat was like the hat's in bad state of deterioration. Like I could barely put the thing on my head. Uh, if I yanked on it, it might rip through. But 
the jacket was a like legit army jacket and it says Quinn. I have the picture of the up close where it says Quinn on the jacket, you know? And it, it was wild. It was cool. And as and he claimed at that point, he's like the only other person that has put, because he couldn't fit into it. He's like, the only other people that have put this on is Robert Shaw and Frank Mondes. Wow. And that was his claim at least. So I don't know. Dude, cause but, you, you sent me that picture. It's you with the rod and the hat and the jacket. And I was like, oh, like, what was this, Halloween one year or some shit? Like, no. I, I did, did not register that that was the legit memorabilia. Oh, yeah, no, that's it. Like, and we had, he, his flight wasn't for, like, another two days after the uh, festival was over and he was staying at Buddy's house. So, like, we had this whole rider truck filled with all the jaw shit in his driveway. We were out there just, like, drinking beers on the barrels and shit. And, like, oh. <laughs> I know. So, yeah, it, it, yeah, well, so like I got my sixteen O, right? But that's obviously there's no real tie to the movie. Like that's like my next thing. Like somehow, some way, like I want a piece of real Jaws memorabilia. And I don't know. So you don't have Matt Taylor's book, Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard, which I told you about. I do not. Okay. Well, yes, you mentioned it. I do not. Okay. Well, listen. You listen to me right now. Santa Santa Claus might be bringing that to your house. Okay. What? But, but, okay. In the meantime, what this book from Matt Taylor, I remember it came out a few years ago. He found everybody involved that he could find with that from extras to locals on the island. And it's the story of Jaws told through huh. all these unreleased photographs from like locals, like people taking pictures of Quint eating a chocolate bar outside the 7 Eleven on the island. And like, it's it's that's pretty cool. It's really tremendous, and you're gonna dig it when Santa Claus brings that to you. But my point is, like, um, there was, you know, you don't realize it at the time, but there was so much for the taking. Like, somebody bought the orca, and there's a picture in there of the the receipt from Universal Studios. He bought the orca for like two thousand bucks to use it for scrap to build a shed. Oh man, I, you know what I mean? And like, so now that stuff is so precious uh. to. To have been able to touch and feel Quint's jacket and drink a beer sitting on one of the barrels, just like I, I just would be beside it was myself. Pretty, it was pretty cool. I mean, I think it might, it probably would have even meant more to you than it did me at the time. Right. Um, it's, it's a great memory. Like I said, I'm a huge fan. I mean, you've gone as far as you've got all, you buy Jaws stuff to collect. And, like you got posters and stickers and shoes and all this stuff. Like, I, I don't do. own anything. Like <laughs> I do. No, like, I ain't got nothing. I do. Like, I do have shoes. I got to admit, it was Sperry Topsider that did a Jaws line a few years ago, right? And like I got nothing them. Nothing says first world problems like Sperry Jaws <laughs> signature shoes. <laughs> I got them and I was super pumped to have them. And then I was like, I can't wear these out of the house you know what i mean like i wanted oh, them come on dude the br- <laughs> chat at the frat would be totally into those <laughs> our boy jimmy fee uh he wore the shit out of them shout out to jim fee like he wore them to the office every day but like they're literally a pair Did of he really yeah they're literally wow. dude they're literally a pair of boat shoes with the approaching jaws and naked woman and jaws like on the shoe so i have them i'm looking they're right here behind me in the same box they came in i've never actually put them on my feet um but yeah you're better off yeah no i mean so uh, to backtrack like you got to play with the memorabilia i got to go out with mundus and that was when he came back for his return and you'll appreciate this story so i mean i got to fish on the cricket which was ultimately the inspiration for the orca and oh god he was kind of grumbly right like he you know he, he he was what he was like you know I, here I am, this kid. I had to be like 21 years old. I was like the intern at Saltwater Sportsman. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Uh, you know, I'd love to have one of your signed books. He's like, sure, it's 10 for the book and 20 for the signature. I'm like, ah, oh, Christ. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like, he was there to get his. And that's all well and good. Um, and it was Captain, always the business, yeah, man. Yeah. And it was Captain Joe DeBella who owned the boat, who was running the boat. So Joe ran the boat and Mundus basically just sat inside and shot the shit. Like that's what he was there to do. And like wrangle blue sharks or whatever horse shit you caught. Cause there's no good sharks left to catch here anymore. Of course. You know, but, uh, it was, it was really rough. I mean, legitimate. You know, six and eight stacked. Like we were climbing out of Montauk, and we were planning on going thirty miles or so to where the um, the sharks were. And you know, I was there with one of our sales guys who brought a client who literally, it's like 
Ugh, God, it's like, yes, it's June. Okay, the calendar says June, but that's not an automatic, like, let's wear a Hawaiian shirt and shorty shorts. Like, it was yeah. cold that day. It was raining. Like, it was like full grundins, like, get your shit together. And this guy was just like barfing all over the cabin. Like it did. It was. It was. It was. It was terrible. But anyway, we got about ten miles into our thirty mile slog, and Debella comes down, and he's like, "This is really shitty. Like, I it's it's terrible. If you guys want to keep going, that's fine. I I don't know." And Mundus came out of the cabin with a with a coffee in a styrofoam cup filled to the brim. Right. This is no bullshit. I'll never <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live. He comes out of the cabin into the rain. Considering we were in eight foot seas, I've never been on a boat that was so like you didn't know it. Like that boat was so rock solid. It was slow, but it was so rock solid. You forgot you were in seas that rough. And he comes out of the cabin and he puts the full cup of coffee on the engine block. And he's like. I don't understand why we need to turn around. You watch that coffee. One drop of that spills, I'll pay for your whole trip. I was like, holy wow. shit, right? And I just stood there and watched that coffee, and we were out there just rolling up and down in these big-ass swells, washing machine shit on top, and not one f***ing drop of that coffee spill. I mean, it, <laughs> like, and, but you know what? Like, we had one guy that was already sick. Like, nobody was having fun except me. So I was kind of outvoted, and we turned around. We never actually got to wet a line. Oh, and then man. the guys I was there with, the, the the sales guys were like, all right, well, we'll get something else going. Um, you know, how about, how about you know, can we stop on the way in and, and try for some stripers? And Mundus was like, we ain't fishing for no fucking stripers. If you're going to striper fish, you take my ass back to the goddamn dock. Like, yeah. he, he was having it, none it of it. Terrible. Yeah, he was a terrible striper fish. By all accounts, from Montauk local, <laughs> the, and that's fine. I mean, I, you don't go with Mondays to go bass fishing, you know. No, you, it's it, it, you know, what my. It's not even a regret because I never had the opportunity. That's one of the only two people in my life I ever wanted to meet. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and that's never going to happen. Well, and just because I had such weird links to him and stuff like that, and like through the Paxtons and their friendship and if i would have known them like a year earlier it probably would have happened yeah and it, it, it's a shame because like they got to know him in a more personal setting than like hey we're going out here with saltwater sportsman Wait, where's your hawaiian shirt jeff <laughs> like it, it, well i know, got I, and, like by all accounts no go ahead no 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 i was gonna say i mean I'm glad that I got to meet him. I'm sorry we didn't actually get to wet a line, but you know, truth be told, people were paying top dollar, top dollar to go out uh-huh. with him for those charters when he came back. And like, I don't, I, I don't think they ever caught a mako. They caught like a couple threshers, but it was mostly blue sharks. Like it was just There's nothing out there. You know, it was just mostly it was mostly blue sharks. And um, I just he doesn't care. I mean, he's Frank Mundus. I know he right? does. He certainly no. I get that, but I I just find it so funny because you know Benchley took inspiration for Quinn off of him, and then I thought that Spielberg fished with him too before he made the movie. Or do I have that wrong? That I don't know. I know Benchley for a fact was with him though. Right. That that I know. But I mean, what they absorbed off the fishing that then translated into the movie, what was like was like nil like i know you, you most of your yeah, one day's work yeah there i mean one day i mean I, I know that the shark the shark fishing you did was pier and and surf based but like you know even little things man like you know quince like you know drop out another chum marker like what is a chum marker like I don't, I don't even know. I don't, I don't know what that is. Like, yeah, I don't know. That's I, not I a didn't thing understand that, what that was ever really either. I've ever used shark fishing. You know, he's got one line out. Did you know the thing that always plagued me? Right, like you're trying to catch a apparently incredibly smart man hunting shark on a rod and reel. What was on the end of that line for bait? Yeah, you know what? I never actually thought about that. What What do you do? Do you put Do you put a, a butterfly mackerel down for that fish? Like. I mean, <laughs> he was dumb and bunker. I know that has always plagued me, right? Um, no balloons, just line going, line going straight down. You know what I mean? That 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 seemed. I never thought about that in all of my years. I never thought about what he was using for bait. Like, dude, shouldn't a, shouldn't a scene have been them putting uh, you know the giant chain hook or whatever the hell through like a side of beef 
or something? Like, what are you going to fool, no, you, I think, gonna fool I that think, fish I with? Think it, no, I think it's better how they just t- steam out of the harbor. You know, they're drifting in a chum slick. Yeah. And, you know, like, <laughs> you don't need the nuts and bolts in between it. Like, and that's fine. Like, it all, it all, like I said, the simplicity of it, 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 it's not meant to be caught up in everything else. It's meant to be like, this is, it's kind of like old man in the sea, but like three men versus something. There's some symbolism that's in it that I've never looked up to try to find out what it is. But, I'm sure you can find it on Reddit, a whole thing, a whole string of it. Yeah, I'm sure you can. But like, I've read interviews from uh, Richard Dreyfus and uh, God, what that Roy Scheider about like, you know, Robert Shaw on set and all that stuff. He was a madman and dude. how he. Yeah, he was a he was a lunatic, and apparently that scene about the USS Indianapolis that he was trashed. Yeah, and nobody thought he could do it, and he did that. And apparently, half of it was like kind of like rift, right? And Shaw and Scheider said they just sat there, like everybody on the set mesmerized at the same time. Like, so like, it was like you were listening and you were believing it happened. Like, it yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Like, it's funny because people don't realize that at the time, Shaw was the only big time actor in that movie. Scheider and Dreyfus were nobodies. Like nobody on the well, island was clamoring to see knows what it, to see those guys. They all wanted to get a piece of Shaw, you know. Yeah, and nobody else even knows. Like, I mean, we're so far removed from Shaw's glory days. That's the only thing that guy's associated with. Like. You can't name another movie Shaw was in. Oh, I can't. Like, he was in The Deep because Peter Benchley wrote that, too. The Deep? Mm-hmm. With Nick Nolte. I don't remember I don't remember that one. I remember The Abyss, and I remember The Beast. The Deep came out not long after Jaws. It was another Benchley book. It stars a young Nick Nolte. It's set in the Bahamas, and you should mm-hmm. watch that. Mm-hmm. But Shaw, Shaw's deal, he was, he was in a ton of movies before Jaws. He was famous before Jaws, but yes. That yeah, is, but he was famous in like 1950s. Like, oh yeah, he was. Yeah, and I think he was. I think he's Irish, isn't he? Uh, Irish or Scottish? Because I know one of the big yeah, things I think was from Ireland. And <laughs> I know. I remember. I know this this book that Santa's is going to bring you will tell you all about it. But when he was here filming that, he would like come over and film for a month, and then like go back to Ireland. Because he refused to pay American taxes for working here. Like, he was like tax dodging this country the entire time <laughs> he was here. And eventually he had to just be here so long that he was just like, F- it, I have to pay. And then he ended up renting a house on Menemsha Sound. But he would only like try and stay long enough where he could claim that he wasn't actually working or something like that. So, that he, was, so he had to pay no taxes. Years. It was only a few years after the movie premiered that he died, right? Yeah, he was he was not alive much car longer wreck. after that. No, he, I think he had a heart attack. It wasn't a car wreck. I thought it was a car wreck or a motorcycle wreck or something. I could be wrong, but I thought it was. I a know heart he attack. wasn't alive much longer though. But I will say, dude, have you ever looked up his kid Ian Shaw? Have you ever seen his son Ian Shaw do his Quinn impression? I actually did. It's pretty yeah. damn good, dude. It's pretty damn it good, is. and there's, he looks there's, just there's like another him. ringer for the. Yeah, there's another ringer for the future butchering of the movie yeah. and his poor father's legacy. And I think I remember reading that Shaw was was like the number three person. It was Gregory Peck, who I know nothing about, and there I want to say it was Redford. I think you're I think but, I think you're confusing Redford because he narrates a river runs through it, which is telling me you actually have seen mm-hmm. that. No, I haven't seen that movie. I could promise you that. <laughs> promise you, I. Watch it, paying to watch people chuck full up for two hours, man. That ain't happening. You ever been on the Jaws ride at Universal Studios? Never made it. Me either. No kidding. No, and I live here. I live here. I know you do. That's why I'm asking. All right, anyway, look. So I, so I do have to ask, right? Like, because uh, I, I know what mine is. Like, what is like the Zach Miller pivotal scene? Like in like, what is like your scene? Like the 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 one that sticks with you the most, man. There, oh, there's so many of them. I mean, there's something about Quinn on that pulpit, man. <laughs> in, in the moonlight, yeah. It like it, it's daytime, and then it goes to low light, then even lower light, and then just nighttime, and just those four quick shots that are like forty seconds total, and until it's just the silhouette of that sob on there, just swaying back and forth with a harpoon gun in his lap. Um, either that or when the 
shark first swims by the boat and you first see the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, so you're kind of taking that one fr- from me. It's like uh, when uh, when Quint says 25. 25. Three, three tons three ton. on <laughs> That is like yep. the, like, every time I watch that movie, you know, and I find. It's chilled. I got uh, chills just hearing it. Like Right? Right, and and the thing is, when I'm out fishing and somebody quotes draw, Jaws, my gut reaction is just shut the f- up. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I hate when somebody does it while we're out fishing, but like as many times as I see that twenty five three tons on them, like I might That's, get that, that. Yeah, I might get I, that tattooed on my lower back. I, I, I mean, if you want that for a tramp stamp, fire away, buddy. But the um, maybe you should get a sixteen zero with a Fenwick with butterfly wings on top of it too. <laughs> but that 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 whole that whole when that music like kicks right there, and he says that, and he's looking just out under the horizon, like just stunned, but he's sure of himself. Like, yeah, it's just, that, that's wild. I mean, I don't go around quoting Jaws much. The only thing I ever quote, I'm like, did you get your rubbers on? Like, that's the only thing I ever throw out. Yeah. People. Did you bring your rubbers? So someday down the line, um, when, when there's a little Zach or Zach at running around, are you going to let your, your, sure. your six year old kid watch this film? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if they're scared, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, like I don't go in the water. Like, I'm shark, man. I love all this stuff. I don't go in the water. I don't know if that's attributed to Jaws or just not, not like, you know, swimming when I was a child, really. But, like, I, I everybody asks me, all my clients on the boat, charters ask me all the time, shark fishing, do you go swimming? I'm like, nope. And it, it's just, they're like, why? I'm like, because I really think that one day one's going to come and try to get me. Like, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I do have that, that kind of same paranoia about it. It's like half joking, but half not. And it, it's just one of those things, man. Like, I, I don't want my kid to be terrified of sharks and stuff. I, do, I would let my kid see sharks in person first before I let them watch it, probably. Yeah, and in the meantime, they can watch Predator. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what was that? The handshake? They lasted like 10 minutes. <laughs> that's that's what you default to in Predator is the the handshake that lasts 10 minutes? How can you not think about that when you think of Predator? <laughs> Arnold, greased up sleeveless. Carl Weathers, greased up sleeveless. And that embrace with the flex. Like, everybody knows that, what you're talking about. And how they're, like, flexing harder while they're shaking hands and staring into each other's eyes like there's a kiss coming. A very aggressive one. see that now if this were a a hunting podcast we could probably do a predator one because i know a handful of deer hunters that watch predator at deer camp like the night before opening day every year that's like the get psyched up movie to go shoot some whitetails anyway uh that was a lot of fun i i i look i'm pretty much worthless at a cocktail party unless the subject is fishing or Jaws. Like, that's what I got. I, 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 I just, I can't really rap about much else. So any opportunity to sit around and talk Jaws with somebody that is as into Jaws as I am um, is highly enjoyable. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And I have to plug the book that I mentioned uh, one more time, and that is Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard by Matt Taylor. It's a few years old now, and I, I remember I got my hands on an advanced copy and I actually wrote about it when it first came out. Um, it's 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 on Amazon now for like I don't know thirty three bucks, something like that, right? And big thick book, all visual, just chock full of of images, like I like I mentioned from extras and people on the island and people on the crew, all this like behind the scenes journal stuff that's been pulled out of shoe boxes that you know have been collecting dust since uh, since the movie was made. And uh, just all these real short snippets and, and quotes, um, and, and you can actually read it cover to cover like a book, but it's it's not like that involved. It's not like mostly words and a few pictures. It's it's basically a picture book. So if if you're a Jaws freak or you have somebody on your Christmas list who's a Jaws freak, last minute idea from your boy Joe C. Um, order that book, man. Amazon Prime. It'll be here like ten minutes after you hit uh, process. You know how it goes. 
So anyway, there is there is one final uh, Jawsy related story that I did not get to tell uh, while Zach and I were talking. Although I believe he's heard it from me, it just didn't come up in the podcast. But um, I I I got to close out with it because it's one of those things that like that haunts me to this day. Uh, it's it's the only way I can put it, and it's 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 funny. Uh, and not at the same time, uh, because now that you guys know how enamored I am with this movie, uh, this is going to be going back to, oh man, it's got to be, I'm, I'm going to guess 2006, okay, because I was still working for Saltwater Sportsman at the time uh, in New York City, and I, I remember this so vividly, it, it was it was, it was was July, it was the middle of the summer, and it was one of those days, like, it was just rank, man, like 95 degrees, disgusting in the city. You know, Manhattan just holds heat like a freaking sauna. So I was leaving our office in Midtown to go catch my train at beautiful Penn Station. And uh, anybody who's ever commuted in that capacity, you know, done like the public transit thing, you know, it's a rush at the end of the day. Like you want to be on that 530 train because if you miss that 530 train, then you got to wait till 603. And it's just like, it's just such a, just a cluster of a rat. It's, it's just, it's just awful. And I don't recommend it. Okay. But anyway, that's, that's what I did for 10 years. Like, you know, fight your way to Penn Station at the end of the day, make sure you're on that 530, get yourself home. And I remember on this particular day, I left the office late. Like I was running behind. I stayed to finish something and I was already running behind because I never wanted to run to the train at a hundred miles an hour. Cause that sucks. I, I like, you know, I like to give myself a nice little cushion of time to get there at a leisurely walking pace. But on this particular evening, uh, I didn't, I was running late and I'm, I'm, I'm carrying a, a huge box with me to the train station. I'm going to take this on the train with me of fillet knives and I think we had done something where we called in a whole bunch of different fillet knives for a test or a photo shoot or something like that. And uh, they just were sitting around at my desk. And that was the night I finally decided, like, I'm going to take these fillet knives home because I can use them. Right. So I leave the office and I, I'm, I got this giant box full of fillet knives. And I'm like, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the crowd walking down 32nd Street towards Penn Station. And um, I, I come to uh, Greeley Square Park, which is between our office and Penn Station. And it, it's right around like the big J.C. Penney's and not far from Macy's. And it's just sort of like a choke point. And there's just always just a shitload of people like at this at this intersection. Right. And um, I, I, I'm just approaching it and I pass by the entrance to the Hotel Stamford and out. Well, I got out of the corner of my eye, coming down the steps is Roy Scheider with a group of people, okay? And he's, like, dressed to the nines, all put together, coming down the steps. Like I said, I'm passing, and I'm, like, looking off to my right. And I, I already got past him when it finally registered that, like, holy shit, like, that's Roy Scheider. That's Chief Brody right there, right? But I'm literally being, like, pushed down the street. It's chaos. I am literally, it was so hot out that I, I mean, I was soaked. Like I just came out of a pool. Like I'm sweating my ass off, sweat running down my face. I'm carrying a huge box of knives, right? And I, I got to the corner and I, I think he came out. He was like waiting for a car or waiting for a cab or something. But he was clearly on his way to somewhere and I stopped on the corner. Now I'm already running late for this train, right? And again, if you're not a commuter, it's hard to understand like the importance of getting on the train you want to be on. It's like anything that delays you is going to, could put you home two hours later than you wanted to be. You know, if a train breaks down or something like it's just, it, it, it's like a game of chess commuting out of New York. And I stopped on the corner and I'm holding this box. It's like super awkward. I have no pen. I have not, this is the days of flip phones. Right, I still had a flip phone, a Casio flip phone. So it's not like I had an iPhone in my pocket. And I stopped on the corner and like I panicked. I was like, 
Chief Brody is right there. He's 30 feet away from me. What do I do? I have nothing for him to sign. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk up to him looking like just like a dumpy, sweat-laden weirdo with a box full of knives. Like, what am I going to say? Hey, Roy, uh, <laughs> sign this 12-inch fillet knife in this whole box of knives. And I panicked, and I'm like looking around like, what can I do? Like, what can I... What can I buy? Where can I buy a Sharpie? Like, holy shit. And in, in those few seconds of like of panic trying to figure out how to capitalize on this, on my idol from my favorite movie, he he gets in a car and he's gone. And I was I was super bummed, right? I mean, I was super bummed, but I just kept going. And I made my train, and I was thinking about it, and I'm like, man, that sucks. Like, why couldn't that have happened while I was going out to lunch that day? Like, or I wasn't in a rush, and I wasn't just like, you know, an absolute wreck of a human being at that point in time. But the kick in the nuts was that he he passed away shortly after. He He was not around that much longer, and I was right there. I was right there. In hindsight, I should have just given him the stink palm, man. I should have just given him the sweaty handshake just to say that I did it. And the funny thing is, working in New York for 10 years, I bumped into uh, Aiden Quinn. I bumped into uh, John Mayer. I bumped into Josh Brolin. I bumped into Jason Statham, and I also once bumped into Julianne Moore, okay? And with all of these people, I felt absolutely n- no need whatsoever to, like, approach him for a picture or a handshake or whatever. I was just like, ah, cool. It's Josh Brolin over there getting a sandwich. Neat, right? So the, like, I just rattled off some A-listers, and none of them mean shit to me. But Roy Scheider was like everything. And nobody was even bothering him because he was old. Like, he didn't even look like himself. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like he had a crowd of people. There weren't a million people going, oh, it's Chief Brody. Most, most people didn't even realize it was him, but I saw him. Okay. He's much shorter um, than, than you might think uh, based on the film. And, I mean, I will just forever be upset about that opportunity being blown. Anyway, that's my uh, burden. That is my cross to bear, not yours. I hope uh, my Jaws fans out there enjoyed this. And even if you're like a borderline Jaws fan, like you're not like a like a Jaws zealot, um, you know, the best I can hope is that this prompts you to go watch Jaws with fresh eyes, with a different outlook, with a little bit more insight than you had before. Follow it up with Jaws 2, okay? I like them together if one rolls right into the other. Um, as we discussed, just forget the rest. They didn't even happen. Okay, throw a Jaws party uh, this holiday season. Jaws theme party. Wear a Jaws sweater. Uh, I might, I might have a Jaws sweater actually. So if it's local, invite me. Um, I might, I might come by. And I like to make um, like, a, like a like a like a chili dip. And then what I do is I put uh, taco chips in it so they look like little shark fins, like the salsa shark from Clerks. Um, that's what I do. Uh, and if you want the recipe, uh, message me for that. And in the meantime, I, I believe the next time I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be talking at you guys is Christmas Eve. So we're going to have to think of something uh, festive for that. Get your shopping done. I know it's, uh, it's crazy rush time, but it'll all be over soon. And then it'll just be f***ing winter, man. But let's not dwell on that right now. It's still kind of the uh, fun part of winter. I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks, as always. Thanks so much for listening to the Hook Shots podcast. And here's to swimming with bow-legged women.